be with you this morning. My name is AJ. I'm the campus pastor here at Renewal Church, Highlands Campus. Uh, we're a multi cert church with a, a site in uh, Wash Park as well named St. John's. But well, great that you, I'm glad that you're able to worship with us this morning, that we could gather together uh, this Palm Sunday. Um, these palm branches, if you got one when, when you came in, um, are really cool just to kind of remember uh, Palm Sunday. You know, my brother and I, what we used to do with these was uh, stab each other with them. You know, and, and hit each other with, I mean, why give out something that looks like a sword unless you're prepared to have kids hit each other with them? I'm just saying, right? But no, the, the true reason we give these is just as a great reminder. Um, you know, even it's kind of cool if you can somehow origami fold, fold this into a cross. I know some people are able to do that on, on Good Friday. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, and then um, typically the uh, Ash Wednesday ashes for next year are made from the ashes of leftover uh, good, or uh, Palm Sunday fronds. So anyway, uh, kind of a cool little, little take-home object lesson for you here. The kids will be getting these in, in children's church as well and no doubt hitting each other with them. Um, but uh, I'm glad to be with you this morning. Uh, I, it's been like four weeks since I was able to, to come and to hang out with you guys and uh, deliver the message. And so I'm excited to get back into it here today uh, with our Look Again sermon series where we're looking again uh, at Jesus and at the events of Holy Week leading up to the cross, uh, to the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus. Um, today, being Palm Sunday, I thought we would read the Palm Sunday narrative. And uh, each of the four gospel writers, they record a narrative of Palm Sunday uh, and of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem that kind of begins, uh, you know, his last week uh, before his death and resurrection. Uh, in fact, many of the Gospels, uh, you know, have half or a third of the whole thing devoted to these seven days in history. So uh, really amazing stuff going on here. Um, because every Gospel writer records something a little bit different in their narrative of Palm Sunday, I actually, I'm going to base it off of Matthew. We're going to walk through um, Matthew's account. But then I'm also, I have pieced in a few passages from some of the other gospel writers as well, as well just to kind of give us some other perspective on what's going on uh, as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Um, you know, it's the, each of the gospel writers has their own emphasis that they want for us to kind of get out of it, and so sometimes if you do what we're about to do, you kind of lose the unique emphasis of each gospel writer, but uh, you know, what we're doing today will also help us to kind of get all the details. So uh, we're going to read here starting Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Um, it's when uh, Jesus and the disciples came near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples ahead of him. He said to them, go into the village ahead of you. You will find a donkey tied there and a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them. That person will send them at once. This happened so that what the prophet had said came true. This is actually from the book of Ze um, Zechariah. Tell the people of Zion, your king is coming to you. He's gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, a young pack animal. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their coats on them for Jesus to sit on. Most of the people spread their coats on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and that followed him was shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! And then a, a little extra from Luke's gospel here. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus replied, I can guarantee that if they are quiet, the stones will cry out. And then from John's gospel, the people who had been with Jesus when he called Lazarus from the tomb and brought him back to life reported what they'd seen. And because the crowd heard that Jesus had performed this miracle, they came to meet him. The Pharisees said to each other, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world is following after him. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar. People were asking, who is this? The crowd answered, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And then from Mark's gospel, Jesus came into Jerusalem and went into the temple courtyard where he looked around at everything. And since it was already late, he went out with the 12 apostles to Bethany. He didn't stay in the city yet. So this is the, the Palm Sunday narrative of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. It's important to understand some of the context of what's going on uh, at that time in history in order to kind of understand the fullness of what's going on here. Um, so at the time of Jesus' incarnation, there were a number of different political factions warring against each other. Uh, it's a good thing we don't have that today. 
uh, right? But we've got, um, you know, at his time, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots. The first two you may have heard of, the last two are a little uh, less well known. Um, but the Pharisees and Sadducees are featured very prominently in the gospel accounts. Uh, Jesus uh, kind of often clashes with them. Um, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they are a different uh, kind of doctrinal schools of thought. Um, you know, the Pharisees uh, believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not. Uh, you know, the Pharisees believed in the oral tradition of the rabbis. The Sadducees said, no, you have to find it in the Torah. Um, you know, so they had some theological differences that they were always kind of warring with each other about. Um, but they also, you know, were people that um, had incentive to sort of keep the status quo. The Pharisees, they were well known and respected by the people as being sort of the, the religious sort of Navy SEALs out there, right? That they were the ones that were going to be uh, total followers all in, right? And so um, um, in the synagogues and amongst the people, they were widely respected. The Sadducees were more the group that was actually in power. They had more seats on the Sanhedrin, the uh, Jewish ruling council. Uh, I think they had a little bit more of a foothold in temple worship and what was going on there. Um, the Sadducees were kind of more elite. Uh, they had a lot of incentive to not have their positions of power that were allowed by the Roman government to be compromised, right? Um, and so both of these groups, they fought with each other, but they also, periodically, they, they each wanted to try and trick Jesus and catch Jesus in doing something wrong, which, newsflash, doesn't work out very well. Right. Um, so Jesus frequently clashes with these two. There's another group called the Essenes, who um, they sort of just separate themselves from society, and they kind of live out, uh, you know, in the, in the hills, in some of, some of the desert areas. Um, the Essenes are some of the ones who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls which were discovered in the 40s, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, then we have the Zealots. The Zealots are interesting. They're the ones, because Rome sort of occupied the land at the time and they controlled things, the Zealots are the ones that wanted to see the Romans kicked out, uh, Jewish Israel uh, sovereignty restored, and they wanted to do it militarily by force. And so the Zealots were a group that was really interested in sort of a, like a guerrilla military rebellion against the Romans. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, Jesus, he said a lot of things. He often clashed with these two groups, right? We don't really have much record of him clashing with the other two. And some of the things he said were kind of interpreted by some groups as, as being more from a zealot position. And so some people had sort of pegged him as a zealot. Um, and indeed, even the people on Palm Sunday, the people that were lining the roads, they were all excited about a lot of the things Jesus had said, they recognized him as the Messiah. They, they didn't quite know what that meant, but they were really excited about some of the things that he had said, and they had sort of twisted some of his words, and in their minds and in their hearts, they were kind of like, this is our zealot champion. In fact, the sort of the battle flag or the symbol of the zealot movement is the palm branch, right? And so as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, he enters in in a politically charged time in which these two groups are fighting with him, uh, and many people sort of go, is this our zealot champion, right? And they're kind of welcoming in, him in, going, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing what this guy will do to help us get rid of these Romans that, that we don't like, right? Um, and so they, they sort of co-opt Jesus a little bit. To co-opt something, right, is to sort of take something that was intended for one purpose and, and make, twist it for another purpose, or to, to take something that somebody else is doing and, and try and kind of take over that and make it about you instead, Right? And they kind of, in their minds, they kind of take over Jesus, and they're like, Jesus can help solve our Rome problem. So he's our guy, right? He's our quick fix guy to get rid of Rome. Um, and sometimes we kind of take Jesus too, and we kind of try and make him more like us as well, don't we? Sometimes we, we take Jesus and we're like, you know, he could be my quick fix guy to fix this or that in my life. Uh, that problem that I have or that thing that I really need. Maybe Jesus is the way to get there. Uh, certainly Jesus agrees with me, right? You know, and if Jesus had a political party, it would be the same as mine, right? And Jesus, he understands why I'm tempted by the sins that I'm tempted by and why I return to those, right? He would kind of give me a pass because he understands. Not your sins, yours are really bad, right? And we, sometimes we make Jesus uh, kind of all about us and we think Jesus is on my side he's not on their side right he would agree with me and really we kind of make Jesus in our own image instead of man being made in the image of God we, we kind of flop it we try and sort of project ourselves on Jesus and, and go 
you know, this is what Jesus is all about. Oh, it happens to agree with me, uh, right? And what happens when we do that is we don't challenge ourselves because we believe like we're already the bomb in Jesus' eyes. We've got everything figured out, right? Um, you know, we uh, think of ourselves more highly than we ought. We're not, we're not very humble, right? We're not able to understand others as much. We're not trying to listen to them and learn from their perspective, right? This is kind of a, a dangerous theological perspective. Instead of taking Jesus at his own as he asserts himself, right? Now, Jesus is the Messiah. Um, he's not quite the Messiah they were looking for. They were looking for sort of a military Messiah. But check this out. Jesus, um, when he comes into Jerusalem, um, see if it was me, I'd make a big entrance, right? And I'd try and look really cool. Um, Jesus comes in on the donkey, right? He doesn't come in on a, a horse, which would be more of a, an animal used for warfare. But instead, he comes in on a donkey, which is an animal used for, uh, you know, farming and work, right? Um, this is as prophesied in Zechariah uh, over 400 years prior to that, right? Uh, and so Jesus, he's not the Messiah they were quite looking for. He doesn't quite look exactly like they thought he would. Um, you know, he is sort of the Messiah that we needed, though. Um, you know, as we, we look on here, um, we, we see that they, when they sat, shouted Hosanna, they said Hosanna uh, to the son of David, recognizing that, uh, you know, that the Messiah would come, as prophesied, from the line of David. He would be a descendant of David, and Jesus was... Uh, you know, if you, Jesus' birth was weird, right? <laughs> the virgin birth doesn't happen, um, right? And um, according to Joseph's line, would have been a descendant of David, uh, right? Obviously, um, you know, some weirdness there with the genealogy being the virgin birth. But either way, they kind of uh, recognized, hey, he's, he's got this lineage. Um, we think he's the Messiah. We're a little bit confused, right? And like I said before, right? He's not the Savior we wanted or deserved, but he's the one that we needed, um, you know, as they line the roads and they shout Hosanna, they shout, save us now. Um, I, I have a feeling Jesus is probably thinking, guys, it's much worse than you know. <laughs> uh, your, your need for saving is far greater than you imagine. Because right, right now, all they're thinking about is, let's get saved from the Romans. Let's have political deliverance, right? And instead, um, Jesus recognizes the true need is for deliverance spiritually, deliverance from sin, from the grave, uh, from the devil, right? That, um, you know, it's what he came to do far surpasses what they imagine that he could do. Uh, you know, they're, they're like, if you could just solve this one thing in our lives, we would be great. And he's like, I've come to help you with this, right? Um, when Jesus, in our minds, is reduced to, to quick fix Jesus, right? Um, money, health, relationships, work, school, legal trouble, whatever it is in our lives as, as someone who can get us what we want, right? And if we just do the right prayers and the right actions, maybe that we can kind of control him into giving us, uh, you know, the blessings we need, right? We reduce, when we do that, the scope of his redemptive work in our lives. Uh, we kind of limit it. We don't understand that what he's doing is total. It's a huge victory of victories, right? Jesus gives us true freedom that we can only begin to comprehend. Because what Jesus does is he doesn't just solve this little problem or that problem or that problem. He solves the biggest problem of humanity from the beginning uh, to the end of his scriptural narrative. Uh, if you look at that, that whole narrative of, of creation, uh, of the fall into sin, of, of all of what is going on in the Old Testament and leading up till now, uh, you know the big problem is sin. And that uh, this, we have a fallen nature that desires for us to be selfish and to make things about us and our hearts aren't always in the right place. And Jesus came to, comes to solve that. He comes to solve our mortality, uh, that th this curse of death, that that has to be gotten rid of. It has to be overcome, right? And to conquer our spiritual adversity, Satan. And so Jesus comes, and he does far more than we could have imagined. Uh, he absolutely defeats sin, uh, the devil, the grave for us. Uh, he, you know, he goes to the cross, shedding his blood so that we might be set free uh, to live life as he intended to live it, um, you know, to, to have life to the full, beginning now, but also for eternity. What Jesus does is incredible. And sometimes when I'm doing premarital counseling with couples, and if you've been in counseling with me, uh, you'll know this, I ask them kind of what their definition of love is. Think about that for a second. What is your definition of love? If you had to kind of give a one-sentence thing. Um, I think a component of it 
has to be that love does what's in another's best interest, often sacrificially. Um, and that's what Jesus does for us, uh, that he, he takes that cup, uh, he walks toward that cross uh, so that we might be set free, so that uh, what is in our best interest can happen. We can be redeemed. We can be set free uh, to live a life restored with God, our Father, for eternity. Um, you see, the people lining the roads, they didn't quite get all of that right. Um, you know, that they were kind of Jesus' fans, that, that Palm Sunday, right? We're like, like, yeah, this is our guy, right? We're not really sure all what that means. And, you know, later on, the, the, it would kind of ditch him when it came to the cross. You know, you don't see a big crowd that was fighting for him to be released. Uh, they kind of leave him when things get hard, right? Uh, and so, uh, you know, another thing that really comes out in this narrative is this idea of, are we bandwagon fan followers of Jesus or something else, right? Um, instead of a fan, how about a disciple. Um, you know, fans, they, they're kind of on board when things look great and then they're gone, right? They don't have skin in the game. They're not engaged. Um, but instead, Jesus gives us a great gift, and that's to recognize uh, that we're called to be his disciples. That instead of uh, making Jesus in our own image, in our minds, uh, that we're called instead to be conformed to the image of God's Son, Jesus. That and there's something about us that doesn't like conformity, right? Uh, you know, we don't, we don't love the idea of conforming with something. Everything about our culture right now is, is about being unique, right? I mean, just look at all the names that kids are getting these days, right? Have you seen the, the list of names and how unique names are getting? Uh, and sometimes they're kind of crazy, right? Because people want their child to be special, their child to be unique, and the name is a part of that. Um, there's even, I think, I heard that in Australia, there's like a judge can actually override your naming decision if your naming decision is like going to be terrible for your child, right? Um, but I mean, everybody, everybody wants to be unique and to be special. And, and sometimes that, the reason for that is our ego sort of getting in the way. Uh, we, have, that we have a big ego that, that wants to make things about us often, that wants to be special, that wants to maybe be famous or to be well-known or well-respected, right? And we all have that come out in our lives at different times, right? That's the sinful nature kind of poking its head out, um, that even though sin is defeated, right, the battle still goes until Jesus comes back, right? And so that we battle against the sinful nature in our hearts and in our minds, um, you know, and our ego comes out, uh, you know, and, and nobody is immune, right? There's times when, when, for me, preaching or pastoring can be an ego thing because you get to stand up here. It's really cool, Right? Um, you know, and the reality is nobody is immune. And so the question is, how has, has your ego, how has my ego come out lately? Um, in that argument, in that discussion, in that proposal, in that whatever, right, uh, where, where you wanted to be known, you wanted to get a little bit of the credit, right? You wanted to get some fans, maybe, maybe some followers, right? Um, God invites us to be free, he invites us uh, to be free from the self-induced slavery of trying to make ourselves a big deal, trying to prove what we think we need to prove, trying, trying to get people to be our fans, trying to use Jesus to sort of uh, get the ideal life now, right? God invites us um, to be conformed to the image of his son. An incredible example for us of someone uh, who thought not of his own needs, but the needs of others first, right? God invites us to get off the bandwagon, and instead, uh, he invites us to embrace the gift of discipleship, to be set free from that continual fandom uh, of, of being fans of Jesus and trying to get our own fans, and to embrace the gift of following, uh, to get in the game, to... Uh, be there when it's easy, when it's hard, right? And to, instead of trying to make our own fans, God invites us uh, to be all about making Jesus famous. Amen. And, and so um, how do we make sure we, we have the right image of Jesus, right? If, if people at, at Palm Sunday were just a little bit off and we want to be conformed to Im his image, we better know how to, what is the image of Jesus, right? Uh, how do we know we've got the right one in mind? Uh, well, our series is called Look Again. And one thing we can do is look again in Scripture. You guys probably saw that coming. That's pretty obvious. Um, look again in Scripture uh, to, to really soak in God's Word and, and to examine our thoughts and beliefs. Because sometimes we take our political thoughts and beliefs, we take our upbringing, uh, we take our personal bias, and we kind of put that on God, right? 
And that's how we end up thinking that, that God is a Democrat or Republican or God, whatever, right, is like us. Uh, and in, in reality, um, when we read God's word, it should be a little uncomfortable for us at times. It should confront some of those things that we are bringing to the table. And a mark of a disciple of Jesus is someone who, when they encounter a difference between their personal beliefs and what's coming out of God's word, is able to go, God, this is tough for me, this is hard for me, but help me to be conformed to your image. Help me to know uh, your word and to put that, uh, make that my belief. Uh, help me to take your heart that you're giving me in scripture and make that my heart for the people that you care about, right? Um, that's what it means to be a disciple. Another way to be renewed in God's image is to do what Jesus calls us to do. Um, this is really cool. Uh, there's a small book in the Bible called Philemon, and Philemon um, is it, just a small book, and it's kind of about this, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not about kind of what I'm about to bring up, but there's this really cool gem uh, here in the beginning of Philemon uh, in, in verse 6 where it says, as you share the faith you have in common with others, I pray that you may come to have a complete knowledge of every blessing we have in Christ. And I always thought this was a really cool passage because often we think, I've got to learn everything about God and then I can go share God with others, right? And once I kind of get all that stuff and I can figure out all the answers, then I'll be able to go and share the gospel really well, right? And the problem is we never get to here because we can never master this, right? But in Philemon 6, it's as you share your faith, you may have a complete understanding of every blessing we have in Christ. So he makes clear that it is it is in learning as we go. It is in soaking it in and putting it into practice simultaneously that we learn more, that our faith uh, matures more, that we begin to have more of an understanding of what Jesus has done for us is by taking with us the message uh, of Jesus and putting it into action. Um, Jesus, he advanced the kingdom of God through spreading the gospel and through miraculous signs. They go together as the kingdom of God spreads, right? And so we too are called to advance the kingdom of God through um, putting our faith into action, through words, uh, through our, everything that we do, uh, you know, helping to love our neighbor, to serve our city, to make evident what God is doing in our lives. Um, and so those are, those are two great ways for us to sort of rediscover and re-image to help us to, to better reflect Jesus to the world, to make him famous, to not be about ourselves, but to be, uh, you know, instead all about the cry of Hosanna for the right reasons. Um, Hosanna has to be our word for the day, does it not? Um, it comes obviously out of our narrative that we read. Uh, it literally means save us now. And if you're kind of new to exploring who Jesus is, this could be a great first prayer, right? Is uh, God, you know, I recognize uh, obviously my sin and need for a savior and Hosanna. Lord, I desire for your forgiveness uh, to come over me so that my guilt can be washed clean, right? Hosanna can also be a great prayer for those of us who have followed Jesus for a longer time. Um, that we recognize the, the saving power and work of the gospel that has come to us through Jesus, that God loves us so much, uh, he sent his son to die for us. He did what it was in our best interest sacrificially. And when we take up the cry of Hosanna, it's in testimony of that. And in, in this word, as we think about this this week, um, think about how the redemptive power of Jesus, uh, it means something not just for one area of our life, but for our whole life. That if there's places of our lives that we've kept shut off from the redemptive work of the gospel, if there's, if there's things that we, we keep doing we, we know we shouldn't do, if there's ways in which God's word uh, you know, keeps confronting us and we haven't yet gone about changing that, that to instead make Hosanna our cry of God, bring your saving work uh, to every corner of my life. Uh, bring your gospel power and influence to bear on my whole life. Help me to be transformed ever more into the image of your son so that, yes, I can be conformed to the image of Jesus, to the image of my creator, and also to reflect him as only God has made you to reflect him. Uh, guys, Hosanna is a great prayer for us as we go about this week. And as a church, uh, you know, our, our mission is, um, you know, connecting uh, people to Jesus, right? Uh, you know, loving our neighbors, serving our city. Uh, as we go about doing that this week, uh, may we think about this passage. May it cause us to reflect and go, God, less of me and more of you. We pray.